Welcome. Thank you Hi. for coming out to the Whalen Library. <clears throat> um, tonight we have Paul Cl Clarice, Clarice um, here to talk about the Boston Marathon and its history. We're very excited. We've tried to have Paul for about two years. <laughs> and it's finally come. No. <laughs> um, he's a freelance journalist, a photographer. I'm going to take this off. Sorry. A freelance journalist, a photographer, and a former newspaper editor. He's the race director of the Cami 5K Run and David 5K Walk in Walpole, and has competed in nearly every distance from the mile to the marathon, including two triathlons, 43 marathons, the Felmont Road Race several times, and has won numerous age group and Clydesdale running awards. He's the author of A History of the Felmont Road Race, Running Cape Cod, and Boston Marathon, History by the Mile, and I feel like I'm forgetting a couple because he's brought some new books to share with us. Visual. <laughs> the Boston Marathon. Um, so Paul is going to give us his slideshow and feel free to raise your hand for a question at any point. If you're here with us on Zoom, um, feel free to put your question in the chat and I will raise my hand and read your question aloud. Um, one more thing, we are recording. Um, and so you'll be able to see this on YouTube and hopefully on Waycam. So your voice may be in the recording if you ask a question. All right, Paul, start. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Courtney, I appreciate it. Um, yes, as you say, and I've also run Boston 23 times as a runner and I've covered it for decades since the 80s. So any questions about any aspect of it, um, hopefully I can help uh, as a runner or just funny anecdotal as well. Um, what I'll do is I'll give you a little bit of history of the race and then I'll kind of take you through the course, um, which is uh, over hundred years old, as we all know. I can find my buttons here and everything. That doesn't advance now. Yeah, it doesn't advance. Let's see. I think you want to clear it. And then there we go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sure. Great. Um, if, it, if it moves back and forth, we'll take care of that. Um, this is Ashland. Right here, Ashland, Massachusetts. Um, in 1896, the modern Olympic games in Greece were held. Um, and the BAA, the Boston Athletic Association, which organizes the Boston Marathon, sent several runners as part of the US Olympic team. And they did very well, uh, gold medals and everything. One of the event was the marathon, which at the time was about 24, 25 miles in 1896. So the BAA members, when they came home to Boston, loved that idea. And they had already had what was called the BAA games which culminated, there was a track behind, if you know the Boston Public Library in Boston, behind it was uh, Irvington Street um, Oval. It was like a track oval and the events ended there. Uh, it was a couple of track events. So they thought, let's have a marathon that could end there. This would be great. So what they had to do is measure 24, 25 miles from that area. Uh, if they went one way to New Hampshire, you know, one way to Rhode Island, other Atlantic Ocean. So they went uh, west, and what they did is they just measured up to 24.5, 25 miles. And it also uh, paralleled the train tracks, which is the current Amtrak commuter rail in Ashland. And they decide right here on Pleasant Street, uh, which is still here, you can visit, which is excellent to see. So right on um, uh, Pleasant Street in 1897 and 1898 was the starting line for the first Boston Marathon. Uh, the 18 entrants, uh, people, men who had signed up, uh, 15 told the line and 10 finished. Um, the Sudbury River, the Sudbury River was, is here. Uh, this is Metcalf Mill, which made boxes, I think, for shoes um, and the tracks right here. It's kind of similar the way it is. You'll see uh, shortly how it looks now. Um, and if you ever notice in the old black and white photos of mile markers back in the day, in like fractions, you know, like seven and a third miles, 13 and a quarter. It was funny, it had nothing to do with the runners. It was where the train stopped so the officials could get out mm -hmm. and have checkpoints. So when the runners came by, they would check them off, go back in the train, and continue on. <laughs> I mean, how do you train for fractions of, of uh, miles or something? <laughs> um, this is actually the starting line in Ashland. This is where you could actually visit um, right now. Um, Ashland's doing pretty well. 
with uh, Marathon Park right here. Um, the um, Metcalf's Mill burned down in the 30s, I believe. So they rebuilt like little pathways here with little informational markers of the history of the race that started in Ashland. Here's the Sudbury River. It's kind of a reverse shot from the one I showed you, um, but that's the starting line. Ashland holds a number of races here. Uh, this one year, Bill Rogers ran at Tim the Black Signet right there, <laughs> which is kind of neat. Connection between uh, the Boston Marathons. So you can go and visit. It, it, it's, uh, they're trying to get a museum there, I think, I believe. And across the street on this side is actually a little marker that says 25. It's like a um, two or three foot white stone marker with the number 25 on it, which kind of signifies that because the configuration is a little different now. Um, so the first two years of the Boston Marathon started right here, um, which is a crosswalk. Um, when the BAA finally <laughs> decided to build their own clubhouse, which they did on Exeter Street, uh, they wanted to change it so the marathon finished in front of the BAA clubhouse, which began 1830, uh, uh, 1899. So what they did is they had to adjust the starting lines. So what they did is they moved it to the bridge right over here, the bridge that goes over the tracks. So for the next, uh, I think, seven or eight, nine years, that's where the starting line was. Uh, so the first two years was right here. The next seven or eight was on a bridge right over here. Um, and then one year they had 105 starters. And like, oh my God, it's huge. We've got to move the start. <laughs> so, which is like, what, a line for the porta potty now? 105. <laughs> so then they moved it, the, the last starting line in Ashland, they moved it to the current four kilometer mark. So if you run the Boston Marathon or drive 135, the four kilometer mark is the last of the three stars that were in Ashland. So you're actually going to run over, for those of you who are running, you're going to run over the last starting line that was in Ashland. Um, and so as you can see, most of these people um, probably also run the Boston Marathon. So between 10, 10 finishes in the first year to the 30,000 that we've been averaging now, um, you get these huge expos. Um, and the 100th, uh, 1996 introduced the first three day expo, which is what we do now. Um, the COVID notwithstanding, you know, regular scheduling about the uh, expo, and picking up your numbers and everything. Um, part of the expo, I love putting this in, but one thing Boston Marathon does a lot that some other marathons don't really do is they do honor the previous champions, they bring them back, they do expos. Um, I was just speaking to someone about the Dana Faber who had Jack Fultz, 1976 winner helps out. A lot of people come back and help out, which is great. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Greg Meyer, who's 83, friends with by Jack. Um, but what I'll do is this is like a, a terrific representation of our <clears throat> champions. Uh, Uta Pippen, who won it three years um, from uh, Germany. Uh, Shalane Flanagan, she had also uh, had run Boston. She's one of our Olympic medalists. She had won Boston. Ryan Hall, who set the uh, half marathon record, one of our top American marathon, is also an Olympian. Uh, Becca Ricci. Um, TC, who had the uh, first American woman to won the uh, seven marathons and seven continents, continents in seven days. Let that sink in. Um, she's awesome. She's still running very, very well. Joan Roy Samuelson, of course, two time Boston winner, 1984 inaugural uh, Olympic ma women's marathon winner. Boston Billy Rogers, four time Boston winner, four time New York, another Olympian. Dina Castor, another great uh, Olympic, American Olympic uh, runner who's run Boston a few times. Beth Poflesky, Olympic medalist, uh, who won Boston in 2014. Greg Meyer, who won Boston in 1983. Um, and, and many more. Like I said, Jack Fulce is, is uh, he's on the edge. That's my point. I missed it. Um, that, that they come back, which is nice. John and Kelly, when he was around still. So it's great to get them. And they're so approachable, as you all know. You can just talk about anything. Um, another interesting facet about the Boston Marathon in April, the third Monday in April, is the weather that we get can just vary. <laughs> As you can tell, this is the famous or infamous, depending if you were in it, 2018 downpour. You can see the sheets of rain coming down. Um, one thing I get a kick out of, this is only about six miles in uh, Framingham, is everyone's wearing different outfits. Isn't that great? It all works, I like, hope. Um, everyone's sometimes people bundled up with hats, without hats, shorts, pants, garbage bags. <laughs> it all works. Uh, we've had, we've had uh, an eclipse, we've had snow. <laughs> Snow squalls, rain, we had a volcano in Iceland that affected 500 entrants that couldn't make it. So Dave McGeary, the race director goes, I have to deal with something that happened not even near us. Um, but you run through it, because April is tough in New England, as we all know. 
Um, this is from 2012, uh, when it was in the 80s and 90s. We knew ahead of time um, so much that the BA offered official entrance they could defer, which was a terrific idea. I still ran it, which I probably shouldn't have because oh, it was hot. It um, this is Natick Center uh, with the fire department. When I ran through Wellesley, that wasn't fast. <laughs> By the time I ran through Wellesley, the bank time temperatures at 91 degrees, which I'm like, why would I want to know that? <laughs> are, you, are you serious? Um, one of the books I was writing at the time, so it kind of forced me to slow down and stop. I had a little camera in my fanny pack, so I knew I just wanted to slow down in the heat. Because a lot of runners, what they did by mistake is they were going to run their pace until they got hot and tired and then adjust. Well, it's too late by then. you got to do it from the beginning. I saw so many people just get wiped out because they tried to do that. You really have to adjust the entire time because it was hot the entire time. It's different if, it, if the hot the heat builds up, which has happened. The 23 years I ran, it was 1990 to 2012. And there were some times it was really nice at the beginning and you could just feel the heat creeping up. Sometimes you don't feel it and you can get in trouble if you don't feel it or aware of it. And sometimes you can. So, but 2012 was a little hot one from the start. It was hot. And we knew that week um, that was going to be that. And one thing, I, so I want to get a picture of this little hazmat tent that the fire department uses to wash themselves off after a fire. So they set it up for us. They had, usually have this anyway when it's hot, but they set this up because it was really hot. So I think I'll stand here and get runners coming through. I kept seeing runners go in it, but no one went by me for a while. So I, I kind of moved the camera. What people would do is they'd come through and go in and out of the <laughs> tunnel because you would dry right off. It was so hot. It, you would just dry off. Um, if they had, like, I was telling Dave McGill, it'd be like a 26 mile tunnel. <laughs> That'd be great. That would go all the way through. That'd be nice if you could follow that. And dense fog we've had. Um, a number of years, because of the dense fog, if any of you have been watching it at home during any of these kinds of years, the TV coverage suffered because a dense fog prevented the helicopters from flying, which bounces off the satellite from the cameras to the studio. So a number of these years, I can't remember which year this was, like 04 maybe, 03 or 04. Um, the only coverage that you saw at home on TV were the people who were on the ground with the, with, with the TV cameras, the uh, Channel 4 and stuff. So you didn't see anything above for a while until this cleared. Um, so that can happen with the fog. As a runner, you don't really care because this isn't that bad. Unless it's hot, then it kind of can keep it in. But this is kind of cool when you're running like that. So um, this wasn't too bad. Comparatively speaking, um, this is Hawkinton High School middle school football field in the back, the Athletes Village, which I think they're returning to uh, this year as well. Um, you get here several hours ahead of time through the buses from Boston, or if you get dropped off, and you stay here. They have a nice little staging area to get calisthenics to get you going. The Porter Johns, the tents over here. Um, in 1996, for the hundredth, the first year we had 38,000 runners. If you recall, it snowed a couple of days before as it does in April, right? Um, so Dave McGillie had to deal with a lot, the race director. So we tried to get all the snow off the grass and the day or two before that weekend, we had two army helicopters hovering about hundred feet off the ground to sort of hopefully dry the grass. Like that. <laughs> um, I always joke to them, I go, I hope he told the neighbors, <laughs> you know, there's no attack because they're army helicopters, so they're loud. They're loud when they fly over, right? Just normally. 100 feet, that's 10 stories, that's nothing. <laughs> that's just about the high school. Uh, it worked, because when, when I ran the 100, then uh, they had sawdust, this is the 100, but they had sawdust and um, um, little hay things to absorb some of the water. It wasn't ideal, but it wasn't bad. A lot of mud in the back, but it wasn't, he did a great job. I mean, 38,000, you know, how many feet <laughs> are trampling on that grass? So now we're in Hopkinton, uh, it all starts here. Um, I will start, give you a little quiz while I'm talking. Uh, this is an extremely famous American marathoner. If you can guess who it is, I'll ask uh, in, in a moment or two while you're looking. Like, extremely famous, you all don't know. Uh, this is Hayden Rowe, where the White Houses are. From 65 to 85, the starting line was actually on the street, a little bit down here. So the gun would go off at noon, everyone would run, and then have to take a quick turn onto Main Street. <laughs> But for our generation, that's all of Bill Rogers to Bobby Gibbs, Bobby Hall, the wheelchair champion, uh, Joni. It was all those starts, 65, 1965 to 85. 
Um, and then they started on, on uh, Main Street, which I'll tell you why later, which we'll figure out. Um, and then it's much more of a straight, straight away uh, start. Uh, and Bobby Gibb in 1966 sort of jumped in on the corner here. Um, they dedicated a statue in the fall that she created. Um, and in the fall, they dedicated it to um, um, Park Center. I think they've installed it here since. Um, well, they, they, that's their plan. I don't know if they have that yet. Um, but the common itself is a great place too. There's two sidewalks and just that it's called Johnny Kelly Crossing. Um, the Team Hoyt statue is on Ash Street. Uh, I'll show you a little bit later, uh, kind of where that is. Um, across the street from here is a Korean monument in front of the church that recognizes the great Koreans, the world record holders and the Boston Marathon winners. So it's a great, it's a good area just to hang out um, with the vendors and stuff. Although if you're a runner, you don't care about the vendors. <laughs> you're not gonna have an Italian sausage uh, that morning. Um, does anyone think they know who this is? Is it Bill Rogers? No, close. <laughs> this is actually Frank, Frank Shorter. Frank Shorter won the 1972 Olympic gold medal in the marathon. Basically started the running boom, it was on TV. It was a great run, everyone saw it, kind of got into it. 76, he won the silver medal. Um, he's won Thalmouth a couple of times. He's actually lives in Thalmouth now, so he was living in Colorado. Uh, the year, this is 05 or 04, he was biked up for Channel 5, I believe, and he was going to run it so he could give reports as he was doing part of the coverage. But it's just an amazing scene. No one knows, just walking around, it's Frank Short. Um, so I got to know him over the years. I show him this photo, he, and he was in Falmouth, and he, this is next to Catherine DeRaver. One of my great marathoners to Kenya, Bill Rogers, and some others. So he's looking at the photo and he's like, hey, he's like a little kid. He goes, hey, look, I'm actually doing what I tell people to do. Look, you're lying down. You rest up. Look, like, I'm like you're fresh. Look. But he's so, he still loves the sport so much. He's so excited that, look, I'm actually doing what you're supposed to do, <laughs> which is true. Um, the starting line is right about here. Uh, this is the BAA office on Ash Street. This is Ash Street that bisects Main Street. Uh, Marathon Way is the little kind of section on the triangles that you see on your right if you're a runner. Um, Ash Street down here is where the school is and the Hoyt statue is in front. Um, the reason it's in front there is that the wheelchair athletes line up in a grid based on their seating on Ash Street. <clears throat> and then when they're taken out to the starting line, they go to the start line in the same configuration that they are on Ash Street. So if you ever notice that on TV, there's usually a volunteer with a clipboard and make sure you're in the same seating. Well, um, Team Hoyt was always there. So they figured that's where he always had it, right down there. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, you know, the father passed away last year. Great duo, if you ever met him. My goodness, the energy those two had, it's just amazing. And I remember I did a story about the statue um, and the artist I think was in Texas and he would, um, uh, Dick, the father would tell me they would FaceTime the progress. And I said, well, you know, what'd you think? He goes, I never knew my head was that big. <laughs> like, what do you mean? He goes, well, they would show me pictures of like my head and stuff. And, and the, the sculptor's like, don't worry, it'll proportionally, it'll fit. And if you think about it, that's right. You never see your own head eventually, <laughs> do you? Ever. You see it in a mirror, but you never look at it. You can't. So he's looking at his head. He's like, are you sure? <laughs> like, no, it's okay. Um, and right here, I don't know if you can sort of see this little yellow in the window. It's a unicorn. It's a horn right there, and it's the nose. And as it gets closer to the marathon, the unicorn moves. <laughs> Until marathon day, it fills the entire window. Oh, it's a neat little thing that no one, you know, promote. It's just a neat little thing to be, nice touch the BAA does. So for those of you who are running or spectating in uh, um, Hopkins, then just take a peek up here and on marathon weekend, it'll be right there fully in the window. So I took this probably a couple weeks before, <laughs> as you can tell. And George E. Brown, the, the Stoddard's Pistol, uh, has been a Brown family member uh, about one year who has started the race. The Brown family is so uh, ingrained in the Boston Marathon, the Boston Arena, the Boston Celtics. There's the uh, post office named after one of the Browns. This Brown family is very uh, ingrained in this community. So it's, it's neat seeing the Stoddard statue, which is lined up right up to where the starting line is. So it's a great area just to see some of these um, uh, monuments too. And of course, the starting line itself, um, which I, I put this thing because I just love this. The police this is marathon weekend will stop traffic if you want your picture taken. <laughs> Isn't that great? 
And rarely will someone beat because everybody knows. <laughs> now look, I've run New York, I've run Berlin, I've run Chicago. You ain't gonna, you're gonna get hit you get to the line in those cities, not in those little cities. But here you thought there's people lined up. Isn't that great? Yeah. You can lie down on here, the police, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> Uh, and the style is always great. Jack Leduc did this for decades. I think his daughters have taken over because he's retired. He painted this. Every year he would paint the starting line uh, that week. And he wouldn't tell anybody what would be different. And each year he would do something different, sort of a, a theme. Um, the first year that we had wave starts, it used to be 12 o'clock coming up, everyone went. Well, eventually we had wave starts, which we do now, a thousand or so runners every couple minutes. So he had the starting line, he painted waves <laughs> on the starting line. Um, this year, this right here, if you can see, is DM Dave McGilvery's initials with the uh, EKG. This year, he had his heart bypass, and uh, Dave got a kick out of that. So they always have like Johnny Kelly when he ran every year. They would have a little logo of Johnny Kelly the elder. Um, there's two Johnny Kellys: Johnny Kelly the younger from Connecticut who won in 1957, Johnny um, El Johnny Kelly the elder from the Cape who won this twice. That's why we say elder and younger, out of respect. Um, so when John and Kelly ran every year, they would adjust the number. And when the year he passed away, they had a real nice picture of him. So every year is different. I don't know what's going to be this year. So for those of you who are running, if you can't look at and trample, but it's always great to the point that I think it was like double, triple the size for the hundred because I guess like, it takes me forever to do this now. I got to shrink this back down. Because um, the old days, it would be like a, a quick line. You've seen the old pictures, be like one little line painted over. It's kind of neat. This is one of the years I ran. I just love this because for decades you just filled Main Street from curb to curb, man, woman, and child. At 12 o'clock, high noon, the gun went off, and everyone went, right, Mills Ace. Um, it's good and bad. <laughs> uh, what happened was on a lot of these things is that again, 1990 was my first year, so I even remember this in my lifetime. When you would run like this, there's no chip on your bib number. So when the gun started at 12, if you cross the starting line at 1219, you're 19 minutes into your race. Yeah. But what the BAA did is they sort of calculated based on your number what you could deduct, and you'd get a little index card in the mail of what you could deduct from your time, mm -hmm. which I wish I still did. <laughs> <laughs> did I get another 10 minutes? Like that? <laughs> um, but a, a natural bottleneck would occur. Because the the uh, it's it's pretty wide here as you can tell, but when you get to the actual starting line on the crest of the hill, it's kind of a little thinner. So Dave McGilvery was given the task of fixing that, <laughs> which he did. What he did is he measured the widest point is 89 feet, and up near the uh, starting line itself was 39 feet. So there's your natural bottleneck, and it just you couldn't get through it quicker. So what he did was he measured 25 feet, which is what it is now. If you ever see those police fencing and there's some space on the road. So you measure 25 feet and that's the, the width of it all the way down from the start to down here. And I remember the first year he did that, I'm wondering, well, now I'm farther back. It's going to take me forever. But it didn't. Because it was a uniform 25 feet, you went very quickly. It, it was amazing. I'm like, wow. I didn't do a lot of engineering, so I guess that worked. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, I'm farther back. But no, it works very quickly that he did that. Um, so I'm glad he did that. But this makes for, you know, I'm a photographer too, so this makes for a better photo. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> You'd much rather have it the way it is now uh, at, at, at noon for a noontime start. <clears throat> now, the one mile mark has the statue, the Spirit of the Marathon statue. So uh, it depends if you're running, it's right, right pretty close and you can't see it. But most people at a mile, they're still pretty focused. You jazzed up, you get the adrenaline, and you don't want to get a flat tire or get elbowed, so you're, you're kind of focused. But this is here permanently anyway. It's a beautiful statue that was dedicated, I think, in 04 for the Olympics. It's, a, it's an identical one in Greece um, where the site of the, the original marathon was. There's a long story about this, which I wrote about. I'll just give you a little nutshell. Um, uh, Stylianos Kyriakidis, the Greek runner right here, who won this in 1946, uh, befriend, was befriended by Johnny Kelly, the elder, uh, excellent runner. But he wanted to also use this opportunity to bring awareness to Greece, which had just been torn apart after the war. So when he ran this in 1946, he ended up winning and he ended up traveling uh, and, and he actually brought home literally boatloads of supplies to Greece. It was, it was 
one of the first, obviously, uh, charity runners, if you look at that way. So they wanted to honor this for the anniversary. His son, Dimitri, is still around. So they thought of doing the statue in, um, I think it was Marathon, Greece. The, the, uh, Mar the Marathon goes from Marathon to Athens, vice versa, in Greece. And have replicated here. The mayor, I don't make this too long, but the mayor initially said, okay, then changed their mind. So then he went to the Finnish. He said, well, okay, but you got to put Spiridon Louis, who, who was a Greek runner who won the, the 1896 marathon. The sculptor's like, it's not a painting. It's just you know, all it takes to create a sculpture. I mean, the base is, this, this, the, this reflects marathon, the grounds of marathon, the, part, the god Pan is on one side, Pheidippides is on the other. It's a beautiful statue. So he kind of compromised and he created a separate figure of Spirit on Louis, who won in 1896. And he basically just attached it to Kyrie Case. And if you notice that because the statue was Kyrie Kaitis and this whole base, that was the original statue. When he created Spirit on Louis, he just basically attached them to this. And if you notice his feet are touching the statue, hence the spirit of the marathon that Kyrie Kaitis is running with the spirit of Spirit on Louis. That's how they got around having this. There's a lot more to it, but that's a, 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 a beautiful statue if you ever get a chance to see it. It's at the nursery, um, uh, the Greenery nursery there in, in the Hopkinton. Uh, unless you want to go to Greece and look at the other two. Um, now, when you're entering Ashland, for those of you who have run the marathon or are about to run the marathon, what's like one of the golden rules that everyone tells you? Don't go too fast. Smart. Listen, even if it's a flat course, but Boston does not. As you can tell just by this photo, it goes down to about here. And you still, I mean, the crest of the start, the crest of the hill is really at the start and then it goes down. And you're already jacked up anyway. You don't need a hill to get you going fast, right? <clears throat> uh, Coach Bill Squires who coached the Greater Boston Track Club. He coached the American winner. All the American winners in the seventies and eighties came out of Greater Boston Track Club that Bill Squires coached. Bill Rogers, Alberto Salazar, um, Greg Meyer, Jack Fultz, who got some coaching from coach afterwards. Um, Randy Thomas, who didn't win, but great runner, Bob Hodge, another great runner, Bob Hall, the wheelchair champion. Um, tremendous list, I can, I can go on and on. Had a great uh, idea that I, it, it's tough to get into, but I, I did it and it works. Try to go behind somebody to keep your pace low. Find somebody who's running just slower than you, just a smidge slower than you, and stay behind that person for about a mile or so. It forces you to go a little slower. So it's just enough, not real slow that he's throwing you off. And do not go like a snake around each person huh. as a waste. Just try to find someone. It's a tough to do, but when you do it, it works perfectly. It's, you're basically getting trained, you're, you're reined in, and you do saddle slower. And after a while, you still, you still see familiar faces that are your pace anyway. If you're not running with a group, that happens anyway. Um, but this is also just a tough stretch. In 1987, I believe 87 or 88, I think it's 87. Uh, they just paved this portion of the, the um, roadway. And there's a little mist, a little light rain, a little mist that morning. It was still a noontime start, 12 o'clock, everybody went. The wheelchair athletes went a little bit earlier. So if you remember the old black and white photos in 87, this is the year that the wheelchair athletes went down. And because the road was so slick, they started sliding around and crashing into each other. And some fell on the grass. Have you seen that photo? Um, they didn't care because Athletes and athletes, they just pick themselves up. But just back then, there were hospital chairs. It was more of an upright chair, so mm -hmm. the balance was a little different. But it was kind of slick. And, they, and again, you go down here fast. Well, five, 10 minutes later was all, all the uh, runners. And back then, they had a volunteer at each end, each side with a rope that went in front of the runners. And they had a countdown, and you drop the rope, and you, you take the rope off the road, and everyone goes. Well, one side was a little slower than the other, and the rope was partially was still there. And the gun went off and a lot of runners tripped over the rope mm. and stumbled upon each other. Same year. Again, Dave McGilvey, fix this. <laughs> Dave's like, um, okay. So what he did for the next year is he paced the wheelchair athletes. So the wheelchair athletes were lined up and he had a vehicle in front. Gun went off for the wheelchair athletes. They couldn't race yet. They had to stay in their positions and go down this hill behind the vehicle. And there was a white line painted, I think when it starts to level off about here. And once they crossed that white line, which made it level, then they could just race. So that's how he solved that. 
um, just to keep the speed down and everything. Uh, but after a while, when the wheel itself became greater, the athletes became uh, stronger, um, they, they, they don't do that anymore because the athletes went, you know, we can deal with it now, which they can. Um, but back in the day, again, the hospital wheelchairs are very upright. You don't have much balance. So I don't think they do that anymore. They stopped that a year or two ago, or a few years ago. For the runners, Dave instituted something they still do. So you see it on TV. Instead of a rope, he has a line of volunteers shoulder to shoulder in front of the runners, right? So then Dave McGillard gets a countdown. Now the volunteers separate, go on the curb. Now there's no impediment, and then the runners can go. Um, so Dave always joked by solving that, he got the job. He goes, oh, that's good or bad, I got the job. <laughs> uh, and these guys here are great. They have, they play like ACDC from like six in the morning. Um, Is that where the biker bar is? Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, you're already jacked up, like I said, but you get this, you get, you know, it's, it's, you know. And they can't in, go anywhere, right? They're yeah, they're, they're in there for like five in the morning. <laughs> they, they close off the roads, you know, along the course. So yeah, half the people, BC, you know, a lot of BC, they're there like six in the morning because you can't go anywhere. So what are you going to do? Drink and watch. <laughs> so, but they are great. It's, 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 it's like a party. Now the starts, that was a noontime start. Now I think the first start is like at eight, 10, eight something. It's like 12 starts from like eight, eight, uh, oh something to nine thirty. <clears throat> so they were there even earlier. Like maybe they stayed over. <laughs> now you're anything framing here. I'll show you the beginning of each town. Uh, the roads are a little more wider, which is great. Um, it's the eight kilometer mark, five miles right here. You're going up a little bit, but the first 13 miles or so, you stay pretty level. You should be, should be in shape to handle that. Hopefully it's a good day. Um, close to the Framingham um, train station with the Amtrak line is right here. Um, watch out for the tracks here. They're pretty flat, but if you're not paying attention, you may skip on it. Great block parties. Food smells great. Don't stop. <laughs> You're gonna want to because it smells really good. Um, this is probably seven or eight miles, I think. I think I am about this slot. Um, one of the great stories is back in uh, early 1900s. Um, Thomas Longboat, who ended up winning, was with about five other runners, and as they're running, they hear the train's horns, which you can hear any year. They cheer you on. It's really great. And so they're like waving us up and. The train's not really slowing down. So they're like, something's not right. So they speed up a little bit. There's those six runners. They go over these tracks and right under the set of lights. And sure enough, the train cuts right in front of the race. Oh so six guys are on one side and everyone else is just waiting for the train. Oh my God. And those six guys are like, <laughs> I'm top six, <laughs> no matter what. Um, about a minute or something later, everyone else went. It was not that much of a field, but still yeah. kind of ruined it. Um, so I always joke with Dave, make sure he gets a train schedule because it's not going to happen ever. <laughs> I, I've done a race. I did a race in Lane that happened. There's like a little lollipop out back and sure enough went over tracks and, the, and the, it's just the weirdest feeling being in the middle of a race. It's like a comedy and you, and you stop for a train. <laughs> and like, you know, it, it's just a weird feeling. I wasn't leading, so I didn't care. It was a good rest, but not for those guys. Uh, now you're entering Natick, that's the link line here. Uh, I always joke with this. This is, I don't know if this is a New England thing. I just love it. When you get the town lines and one DPW pays their town <laughs> and they stop right here. I, I just, I get a kick out of it. I don't know if it's a New England thing that, that, that is so defined like that, but you know you're in, even without the entering Natick, you know you're in two different towns right here, <laughs> right? Um, even Natick loses a little bit of a shoulder too. But yeah, there's a little bit of the hills there. Um, but again, even momentum should be able to carry yourself over these kinds of hills as a runner. Um, about nine miles in Natick, the lake on your right. Um, one of the great legends is Tarzan Brown uh, back in the 30s, one of our great runners who has won Boston. There's no guardrail then, the road was configured a little different. And one of the years he ran, it was very hot and he jumped into the water, cooled off, went back on the course and finished. What he really did is he kind of sat on the edge, took his shoes off and, and uh, cooled his feet. Because as you know, in hot water, your feet can uh, expand, give you blisters and things like that. So he cooled the feet off. I like the first story. <laughs> I put them both in the book. And, uh, I kind of like, as a writer, you like the first story. Um, and the Red Sox, since the 60s, with a few exceptions, have had a game on marathon morning. When it was a noontime start for the race, the game would be letting out in Kenmore Square just about the time the leaders would finish. 
Um, so you'd get 20, 30,000 extra people in Kenmore Square um, who by the time us people will be finishing, will be drinking for another five hours. So it's great. <laughs> you know, and you just, the, the cheering and the support um, uh, is, is phenomenal. And I've run enough times with people who are just out of state, you know, you bump into people as you're running, you, you, it's like a tourist thing. You chat with people from out of state, out of country, who have no idea what this means. <laughs> They're like, what's a Sox? You know, see, so yeah, what's going on? You explain, oh, it's the Red Sox baseball. <laughs> and if they, don't, if they don't know anything about baseball, then they get it. <laughs> uh, but you'll get things like this. You get kids with little clapboards with scores. You hear the radio. It's great. It occupies your time. Um, right about here is, I think, one of the first times you get your picture taken. So look good. Okay. <laughs> you always got to look good. What Billy Chris will say on Saturday Night Live. Better to look good in the field good. So look good for the photos. <laughs> I think it's right about here, you'll see. Uh, now they have like a cherry picker, so you'll see them, the photographers are shooting down. Uh, oh, another thing here, I don't know if you're still here, if anyone's done this a number of times. Every year I ran this, people fish along this, which is fine. Like they'll be standing at the guardrail, but there's always somebody on a little canoe right on the water here that's close enough that I know they know there's a race going on, but their back is always to the waters. <laughs> it's the rudest thing every year. Never acknowledges 30,000 people behind it. It's, it's the weirdest thing. I don't know if he does it out of spite or it's like always like one guy, you know? I, I said this to one other place and someone said, maybe it's one of those Disney animatronic things. Just yeah. to, I don't know. I don't know if he still does it. It's a funny thing. But Nate has those kind of quirks um, with things like that. Um, and in the center of town, which is a little different, um, what am I, five miles from this? Four, five miles? This is different than Legion, but you could, in the old days, you could hear the flag flap, which was really cool as you were approaching it. Um, and the, the spectator is a little closer because the previous miles are a little wider streets. But when you get to the center, it's really neat. You know, you start to get into neighborhoods. So it's really, it's, it, Boston is nice um, in that you get a lot of different variations and everything. Um, this is familiar, sure. So, uh, and right before here, I think there was, I don't know if it's still now, there's a little alleyway. And every year I ran it, there's someone backed in like a flatbed truck. And there was a guy with a microphone singing for like <laughs> hours. He was really good. Um, he had his like Neil Diamond, sparkly, <sighs> chest bearing, high collar <laughs> shirt, and doing the Elvis dips. And he was singing the Dean Martin Sinatra, Neil Diamond. It was excellent. Great voice. So, you get, all sorts of neat things that you look forward to as you're running, whether you know about it ahead of time or not, it just breaks up the monotony of running because what are you doing? You run, you run and you look. Um, you go shopping, see what kind of shirts and shoes you like, maybe you want to get next to you, right? So you do when you run. Um, but the pirates like that. Um, another spot, I can't remember if it's Natick or Wellesley, on the left in front of a children's center, they have about a dozen trampolines set up. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> here. Center. Yeah. Yeah. And they have kids on the trampoline. It's really cute. It's great. Yeah. Inevitably, every year I ran this, some, I don't want to say moron, runner, I'm going to do that. Oh. Gets to like the third trampoline and lands on his face oh. every year. So don't do that. It looks like fun. It is fun. But your muscles are only doing one thing. It doesn't want to go on a trampoline. And I know you're into it. You want to get excited. Don't do it. Don't jump on a trampoline. Do it later. Because I've heard, I heard a story, I was running with two guys who were ahead of me, the rain photo that I showed you earlier, that's around the 6 to 10K mark. There's a water station on the right. And it wasn't that, that year, but it was a different year. And two guys were just talking in front of me as you run, so you'll be used to operate. And one was saying, is this where it happened? And he said, yeah. And he, was, he didn't know I was here listening. And he was going to the water station to the right. And as he got close to someone, barreled in to get water and knocked him over and he broke his collarbone oh on the curb because the curb's right there. I'd rather break my arm as a runner, right? Tape it up, I can suck it up for whatever. A collarbone, uh, I don't know how you can run or a rib, I don't know. So now since I heard that, every time I go to a water station, I'm like playing basketball. I'm like, <laughs> and you would not believe the amount of people bouncing off, especially now with the ear, I don't wear music. Boy, are people not paying attention. So. You really look around when you go to a water station in particular, just, just be ready for, you know, if someone bounces in and they don't do it maliciously, but you got 30,000 people every thousand, every couple of minutes, there's a lot of people there. So just keep an eye on that. And uh, it's just reminding me here, sometimes this would be slippery if it's a little slick. 
the wax cups or orange slices, I must uh, um, flip back on orange slice. You know, that a big guy. So it's a little thing of orange slice that knocked me down. So it's amazing. Uh, another place in Natick. Oh, did he? Oh, I'm just going to yeah, ask. That's my, uh, my brother in law's lives right across the street. Really? They like give out water every and day. They used the, oh, they my moved. goodness. This was Natick. They sold that property and now they're building like oh. senior housing or something. I hate to say this thing. Because he was going to miss it. Well, Scott. anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, I'm not. I don't want to rub it in now because. No, you can't look forward to it. It was the best. It was. Every year, there's an engineer who lived here who someone was telling about would build a facade of something on a flatbed. And it was awesome. The, the year I took this, obviously, was the Fenway Green Monster, the Coca Cola, the Fowl flying. And there's people up here standing on the little flatbed. Uh, when the Zakem Bridge was built, there was a Zakem Bridge that was uh -huh. higher. Um, uh, one year, he actually built. A replica of the house that was like a dollhouse with no front, and they were sitting on the floor. It looked just like the house, as if he just opened up the house like a dollhouse. And it's not there anymore. Oh. Oh. But that's one of the things that, that, that yeah. Boston isn't that great? Oh, so cool. Um, we all look at it, it's a really neat thing because it, like, like you said, they close off streets, you're not going anywhere, yeah. so make it exciting. You see, if you run this over and over, you'll see families grow up. Like Family Road Race does that with their water stations. You see generations, which is terrific, you know, and some will run after a while, but you, you actually see them when they're playing music. And year after year, you see kids playing music in the driveway and you go, hey, you're getting better. <laughs> it's true. Um, still made it one year, uh, one of the early years I ran this, this is 2012, the hot year, so he's not wearing his jacket. I think he skipped a couple of years, this gentleman. Um, real beard. So it's a little uphill here, so I always have a hat. So you look, you know, when you look down, short of stride, so I'm going up the hill on this side, and I see his close to the curve. I see these black shoes, right? And seeing his white cuffs, these red pants. I'm going, who the heck is this guy running? I look up, and it's Santa, right? And this is the middle of April. And he's going, you boys and girls have been good this year. I'm going, ah. And I told my friends after I finished, no one had seen them because when they came out there, like probably on this side of the road, and more people. Uh, it was a different year. So I go, I swear I wasn't losing it at nine miles, <laughs> 10 miles or whatever. I go, come on. That wasn't Jose, yeah, that was a new. <clears throat> so the next year I ran, I brought a little camera in my fanny pack and took a different picture of Santa. So I thought, I'm going to prove myself. So I went on the sidewalk, nice jacket, same guy. I go, I remember you from last year. He goes, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, I got a picture. As I was saying, this, this little guy <laughs> comes from behind him wearing all green with a little bell on his curled <laughs> shoes with, you know, flavored, I mean, um, colored. Uh, cuffs with a little hat dressed as an elf. I'm going, well, maybe, maybe this is the year <laughs> I'm losing it. He goes, hey, you want to take a picture of it? Oh, you're real. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so he took a picture of me with Santa. So I showed my friends and I was up with him. And every year I look forward to him. And again, 2012, this was a tough year. Like I say, in the 90s, and he was there. I'm like, Santa, you're not used to this. He goes, oh, I'm losing weight just standing there. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, so you know. <laughs> But that's what I need about Boston. Other marathons do that. But I'll tell you, Boston is so dense with these kinds of neat things. And they know their stuff. If you're struggling, even if you kind of don't really struggling yet, they'll see it because they, they see all the runners. Boy, they, I remember on Newton, a heartbreak hill, I was really struggling one year. I'm getting yelled at. Worse than any of my two older brothers yelled at me when I was a kid. To, but it's to get me going. And they will, they'll shake you out. And if you're in trouble, they'll get help. There's like medical, they're so good throughout the whole course. That's amazing. Uh, one thing for Boston. <clears throat> Entering Wells in the college, um, unless seeing this sign. This is another thing Boston does, a DPW side or no parking. They didn't have to do that. <laughs> Just put a no parking sign. But this is another thing that Boston does. It really, you know, opens up the community for the race. Um, and they do that for like a month or two ahead, which is neat. This is Wellesley College, a screen tunnel, which you all love, Mungar Hall. Um, it started at the beginning. The, uh, the women knew a Harvard runner from the first year. And ever since, with the exception of one year when the marathon was on Easter break, uh, they've been there every year. Um, and the reason the screen tunnel is to a point they could be on both sides of the road, which you can't do anymore. But it was actually a tunnel, even in my time of running, they were on both sides. That stopped in 96 of the hundreds because they just had to accommodate so many people, if you notice, it's no fencing. Um, and remember the old falls of Bill Rogers, 
it's like the, the Tour de France, you see the cycles go down and the fans separate as they're driving down. Well, the 70s and 80s and stuff, you remember seeing Bill Rogers running and like the crowd was sort of separate because there was no fencing, there's no police forces, there's nothing even here. This is 83, I think, this photo, and there's no, fence, no fencing. So 96, they did the police fencing, and obviously after the bombing, they were real sure they wanted to know who's on the course legally. Um, so they're no longer on one side, but they cheer you on, and it's amazing that they do. Um, again, Mungar Hall started it, and what they actually did is, um, actually a couple of, I tried to think where, maybe a dozen years ago, they started something with social media, and I just saw them reporting it now on Facebook, that if you want to have them, if you want to assign, say you live in like Australia or something and a family member is running or you want to cheer them on, but you can't make it, um, you send them the name. And for a week or two before Boston, I think they're doing it right now, I saw it on a post, they will make the signs. So some of the signs that you see, you know, Johnny from, you know, whatever, uh, they'll create, even though you can't be there. So it's really neat communication like that. Um, but then you hear the din of them before you get to them. It's amazing. I've, had, I've been running and people from out of state going, oh, is that the train coming? Like, well, it could be, but it also could be about <laughs> 500 women yelling. Like, what? Said, yeah, they, they, they don't stop. It's, it's amazing. It's just a short portion right here, about 13 miles. 13.1 uh, is closer to the center of town. But they'll do that and to the point that the elite athletes know it. I remember if you remember uh, Ibrahim Hussain from Ethiopia who won us twice. Uh, he had a huge fake, like, ah, you sold out. Like There's a Ryan Hall high five and stuff. It's amazing what they do. They don't stop. Um, one of the other photos that I used to show <laughs> shows the difference between the sexes, the men and the women running. That uh, men are too smart. The women will run, keep their form, enjoy the support, high five or something. Guys will just chest out, how you doing, chest? <laughs> Do this, change their whole pace for this quarter mile. I, I had a photo that juxtaposed it too, like a woman's running and enjoying it, good posture running, and then like three guys will, hey, that doesn't come before. And you know, in about a half a mile, the guy's gonna go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it does, because it fills you up. You, you can just feel it in your chest of the support. I mean, you, you just, it's amazing. And as you go by, you still hear it behind you. It, it just, it'll fill you up. It's a great, Great spot to have too, just to give you a little extra boost, kind of get you going. Um, but don't change your pace. <laughs> don't do what we do. We're not that smart. Entering Newton here, Newton Low Falls, the uh, Route 128.95 is right around here. Uh, for different, depending on your generation, the Pillar House used to be right around the corner here. Um, this is the first little tough area, first downhill. It's very it's difficult because the first 13, 14 miles, you kind of run the same pace. Kind of staying level, you really got to start using different muscles here. Uh, Bill Squire is what he did, what Coach did with a lot of his guys. Uh, he'd take them out here. And, and um, what a lot of runners used to do, because the Greater Boston Track Club started in 1973 and the running boom was just starting, to sort of parallel that. So a lot of things runners do now, you weren't doing that or you stumbled upon that or you started to get training for that. One of them was uh, cutting tangents. The cutting tangents is, you don't really run like you're an 18 wheeler. So if you're running down here, you don't go wide, you cut the corner. So you just, you know, instead of running here and you go wide out here, you know, cut the corner. It's called cutting a tangent. You see the, uh, when the camera's in front of the elite athletes, you'll see kind of like a parade. If they'll cut the corner as quick, you know, you're running less, basically. If you're garbing it, you kind of, that's the least amount. But back in the day, it didn't. They either went in the middle or some marathons would have a blue line, like New York and everything. Boston's never had a blue line painted in the middle, which was the entire course. I remember joking, I asked Dave McGilvery, how come we don't have a blue line painted? He goes, Paul, we got yellow and white lines that drivers can't pay attention to. Put a blue <laughs> line in the middle. Good point. I said, All right. <laughs> so, but the, the runners would stay in the middle. So what Coach Squire said, no, because uh, he brought a tennis ball with him on some Sunday morning, the top of this hill, with his guys, with his Greg Myers, his Rogers, his 210, 212 fast guys, 280. And he put the tennis ball on top of the hill because I want you to follow it visually and see where this tennis. So he dropped the tennis ball, and the tennis ball will go with the least resistance down the hill just to get a visual in their head. So now you'll start seeing runners, no matter what level, will do that. But back then, you didn't really go, I'll just go in the middle. That's where the course is. And obviously, in the wing, a lot of roads, in the middle of the road, it's got to go heavy for, for drainage. 
as well. So you know, you gotta keep an eye on that too for your ankles. Um, but this is a good spot to just get your different part of your muscles going, going over the hill to get the Newton. This is 19.1 <clears throat> mile mark where the John and Kelly statue is. Um, Newton City Hall is right behind the statue, about a tenth of a mile. Um, the Newton Hills are fascinating because they're not really bad. It's just where they are that makes them bad. But in between each hill is recovery, enough flat and recovery as a runner. So as a spectator, when you would see all the great runners sometimes use these to their uh, advantage, um, the canyons do this now. Uh, Jolindo Bourdain, Bourdain from Italy did this in 1990. Coach Squires taught Bill Rogers and those guys in the 70s how to, how to beat those guys who were close to you on the hills. What he would do is when you take a ride at the fire station, 17 mile mark, and you go on up the first hill. If Bill Rogers, and he had always done this, had someone say he's leading the guy around on his shoulder, and maybe not too familiar with the course or whatever. Coach would always say, you can't beat a hill. We'll train on the hill, but it's the flats where you do it during our training intervals to run faster spurts. He goes, so run the hill, your normal good pace. On that first flat, do your speed work. You know, drop five, 10 seconds pace. Go fast like we did in training until you get to the next hill and you return to your normal hill pace. Well, what happens, the guy in second who now has his distance goes, I gotta catch up to Rogers. He starts running up to Rogers, not realizing he's catching up to Rogers on that hill. Now you get to the top of the next hill. Bill does the same thing, takes off on that flat, gets to the next hill, returns to his hill pace. Guy goes, I gotta do that. You do that for three, four hills. By the time you get to BC, Boston College, at the end of Heartbreak Hill, the guy's legs are shredded and Rogers who had done it correctly or Kenyans who are doing it correctly, I don't wanna say breeze through, but they are not as suffering and the guys behind them. And, and they did that all the time. They trained that way. Um, Bill Rogers, uh, Coach Squires had a great thing called car tag. If he would get all those guys, the like Greg Myers and Rogers, on a Sunday morning, on a good portion of the course, and he would say, all right, I want, depending on the mileage, because all right, I want you to start at four minutes 50. Until you see me, I'm gonna drive up at some point. Could be a quarter mile, half mile, a mile. When you see me, I'm gonna yell out a different pace. You do that pace. And he would do that for whatever mile training was that. And Greg Meyer loved that one because it was great. Because so we're doing, say we're doing five minute pace. And we don't know where he is. And he, he would never tell us. It wouldn't be more than a mile or so. So in about a half a mile, there's coach sitting in his car and he goes, all right, 450s. Now they're all doing 450s. So what he's doing is replicating what can happen in a race. Because you don't know when you have to really shake off a couple of guys. And you know the range of what they're going to be running in. So one of those kinds of intervals, because coach was great with simulators, so you simulate what's the race you were going to be at. So he loved doing that kind of that kind of course, or light to light, from satellites to satellites at a different pace. Just so it stretches out your legs, you run at a different pace. Um, it's good if you're an elite athlete or not. You need speed work even for a marathon, which I didn't know the first couple of marathons I did. Until my coach from high school said, yeah. <laughs> A little slow on it. Um, the Johnny Kelly statue is terrific. This was originally dedicated right about here, up the street, and it was facing the runners. <clears throat> uh, but shortly after it was dedicated, someone hit it with his car, and broke, broke the arm. Like I said, blue line, can't even do it. <laughs> so um, they fixed the arm and they put it here. It's about 80 feet back from the course. It's just found out. Um, and it's, it's facing the runner. I wish it was closer. You can't really see when you're running the marathon because there's like a sausage truck here. And I wish it was in a different spot, but it's a beautiful statue to see. It's Johnny Kelly in the 30s when he won, holding hands with himself in, in the 90s when he won. Um, he, he started 61 Boston's, finished 58 of them. He's won twice. He came in second place seven times. Olympian, great storyteller, excellent statue to do. Um, and Heartbreak heals up about another mile. I don't know why they didn't maybe just logistically have to get up at 20 and a half or so. But in 1935, when uh, John and Kelly won his first of two, he also won in 1945. He was a favorite in 1936. So as he's approaching this area and going up towards what is now Heartbreak Hill, Tarzan Brown, one of my great runners, was ahead of Johnny. So Johnny caught up to Tarzan at about 20 and a half or so and sort of tapped him on the back, kind of like, I got it now, which sort of woke up Tarzan Brown and just took off. And Johnny ended up in fifth place that year in 36, Tarzan won. And Jerry Nason, who was a sports editor of the Boston Globe at the time, 
uh, recognized that move and said that move broke Johnny's heart. Mm -hmm. And that morphed into Heartbreak Hill. And Johnny has always said, I should have done that. He goes, it's about two or three little second places I should have won. I made a mistake. When you're going to pass a guy, everybody knows, especially culture tell you, you pass the person. You don't run up and catch up and you go, oh, I got him. You <laughs> keep going. Even if you're struggling, because if Johnny kept going beyond Tarzan, maybe Tarzan would have had that second, uh, second win. Uh, 21 miles at Boston College at Gasson Hall. Beautiful sight. Whether you're a Jesuit or not, when you're running the Boston <laughs> Marathon, when you see the towers of Gasson Hall, this is the top of Heartbreak Hill. You're going to love it. Um, Right over here, it crests a little bit and you start using your downhill, but your hills are done. You still got five miles to go, don't worry, but your hills are done and hopefully you're doing okay here. Um, Bill Rogers sort of half jokes, there's a medical tent right here. He's dropped out a couple of times here. Um, his first time he dropped out in 08, 09, he dropped out, he was doing it for charity, I think. He was sort of half joking, because if you see an elite athlete who's not injured, in any marathon that drops out around 20, 21 miles, they do that on purpose because they probably figure that it's just not my day. I'm not in the top. They get paid top 10, top 20. They may figure that I just don't have it. It'll be a training one for me because, you know, they want to save themselves because you can only really do two marathons a year, highly competitive. One in the spring, one in the fall. Um, you can run on a day if you want, but um, to make a living, they'll drop off and they'll just ah, do it because they're 20, they're training one to 20, 22 miles. So he was sort of half joking. But he does like the medical tent days. Ah, I'll stop here. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a great spot. BC supporting you going down here. Um, it's a perfect place. Also, you get your second wind if you need it, because this is the other side of Heartbreak Hill where you're going down the hill into Brighton. Lake Street right here. More halls a little different now. Boston College is on your right here. Um, this is a tough stretch because the tracks are here. The green line starts here. So there's no spectators on the left. There's a cemetery on the right, which can bring you down. Uh, you wallow in it too much. Um, it's a tough spot because you behind you are sort of all the marquee highlighted awesomeness of Boston as a runner. But don't forget, you still have a 5K is a 5K. Beacon Street, as you'll see, undulates a lot more than you think. And uh, I made a mistake first couple of times. Ah, I'm done with all the tough part. I, I can do a 5K in my sleep. Well, yeah, you can, but not after running 23. It's a lot of mental stuff physically. So um, that's why you see a lot of lead changes on Beacon Street with the elites because they know. Um, everyone knows the marathon doesn't start until 20 anyway. So add that elements, how you feel, who's next to you, who you're racing, all the variables. This is the race right here. Whether you're going to be a leader, age group winner, or you want to finish or raising money for charity, this is your race. This is what you want to do. You want to enjoy it too. You don't want to struggle. Uh, that's not fun. Um, Dave McGilvery always tells the story um, about himself. The first year he ran, he was a teenager. He was, uh, how does he say it? I was younger. In other words, he ran as a band. But you can't say, I can't say that word. I was, I was too young, whatever the age I was. And his grandfather, who was a big supporter of his, was waiting for him to finish, to, to cheer him on. And Dave dropped out right around the bend here. Um, he didn't finish. So later that night, grandfather goes, don't worry. You know, learn from what your mistakes were. I'll see you next year, same spot. We'll do well and everything. Unfortunately, grandfather passed away before the next year in Boston. And Dave ran it in his honor and everything. And kind of bonked around the same area. Um, this is also the area where most runners will hit the wall. Actually, all runners will hit the wall in varying degrees. Elite athletes hit the wall, but it's like nothing. The wall, for those who don't run, what the wall is basically, your body has inherently a certain amount of energy in it. For a marathon, a long endurance, you carbo load in the days ahead, the passes and everything, to stock up the glycogen in your muscles that propels you. What you want to do is, as if you're, say you're driving down a hill, and just as the hill in a car, say just as the hill starts to level, you put, you know, you, say you're in neutral, and you want to put the car in a gear just as you go from the hill to, without, without a hiccup. That's how you want to do physically. You want to go from your natural stores into what you've stored smoothly. The wall is that little gap in between that either you didn't carbo load enough or it's just not happening. There's always a little gap there. And it's always around this area because the body has enough kind of just to get you, you know, the, putting all the variables in. I'm simplifying it, but 
it's kind of just for those who don't know when you keep saying, well, I try not to use shortcuts words, but by hitting the wall. So David hit the wall twice. But what he did when he sat in the curb on he, he turned around, he noticed Evergreen Cemetery was right there. That's where his grandfather was. Mm -hmm. So every year when he runs a marathon, which he does, so he has 50th year running a marathon, he runs out there when else was run. He pays his respects to his grandfather right around at Evergreen, which gives him, you know, he's running with his grandfather. It's a real nice sentiment to have. <clears throat> um, so Dave runs this every year after everyone's done or after everyone started. Usually on the old days, like three or four in the afternoon, he would be driven out to Hopkinton and he would walkie talkie to the guys going, I'm going to be out there. Is everything okay right now? He's, he'd be clued in with his walkie talkie. And him and some state troopers would run after everybody. And he'd finish around 10, 11 at night, depending. I used to joke with them, I go, You always finish around 11 04 at night when the news guys were still at the finish line. I, go, I don't know why, Paul. Well, I always did that. Right? Because we'd always see him finish live at like five past one. He goes, I don't know how it's going. Because it just happens that way. <laughs> um, now, 23 miles. I remember talking to Dave again about uh, Beacon Street. He said, um, he goes, you know, you can see the skyline. Beacon Street's got some hills. I said, no, it's my first couple of years running. I go, no, it's pretty flat. He goes, no, Paul. You know, I got no more years. So it wasn't lecturing me. But he's like, no, it is. It's an interesting. Because I wear a hat sometimes, so I don't look up. But one year, I looked up. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty, I'm pretty high. If I can see the skyline of where I'm going, there's the crew and there's the handbox. The finish line's right there, I'm three miles away. Wow, I am high enough to see that Beacon Street's got some hills. So I include this to let you know when you're driving this or you're training on it, you're not really paying attention, but these hills can shred whatever you have left in your legs. So it's great getting the support for everybody here, too. It's a tough stretch. You know, um, depending how late you are running, how many people are there. I remember I did a story about the, uh, the, the uh, Greek wreath that I presented to the uh, winners. And the governor and mayor presented. So I did a story. I interviewed uh, Governor Dukakis, who still works at um, Northeastern. And he's from Brookline. So when he was a high school kid, he ran this in three hours, 31 minutes or so. Excellent run. So around this time, this area, he's, he gave me a great story. He said, well, I'm running this. And he hadn't married Kitty Dukakis yet, or Kitty, I don't know where her maiden name was. So he said that after um, they got married or during uh, dating or whatever, she said that he gave him water around here because they didn't know each other. He goes, really? You gave me, because there was no water stations back then when he ran it. <clears throat> but he goes, you know, if she says she gave you water, <laughs> she gave me water. <laughs> I'm going to believe. Um, so I have to remember that when I go through Brookline, because each mile marker now has the town on it, I always remember, where's Kitty? I want water. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this I put in for fun. As I talk about this, see if you can figure out why I put this photo in. This is about, uh, I don't know, maybe a mile or less than a mile or so from the Mass Pike overpass. So about the 25 mile mark is about that Kenmore Square area. This is just before that, the church on your left and everything. Um, Around this area, one of the winners, 1899, 1900, tripped over cobblestones, mm -hmm. but still won. Mm -hmm. that back then, it was, a, it was a windy storm, and those cobblestones actually turned up the stones. Um, does anyone have an idea why I put this in? The Boston Line. Boston Line. Of all the other towns I've shown you when you entered, there's this nice, beautiful entering Wellesley sign. The only part on the course <laughs> after which it is named is this sign <laughs> that is actually parallel to the Beacon Street sign. So it's not even facing you. The St. Mary's is facing you. Unless they put a different sign. Every year I ran it, the only place, and you're in Boston, the left Boston proper, the least amount of miles of the entire marathon. And that's the only thing that said it, the Boston line. This is, this is entering Boston. There's this little line here that, where this um, street sign is. And every year I ran it, I tried to find where this was. I had to take this picture a different day for the book because I, I was going to take it the past couple of times I ran. I, just could, I couldn't remember where the sign was. Nothing stood out. This is the only thing, and you can see how old it is. I hope it's still there. Um, they were doing some construction, so maybe someone recognized and put an entry in Boston. But from 1990 to 2012, when I ran it, there was no nice big silver entering Boston sign on the course. It was this uh, St. Mary's. On your right, take a little plaza. I remember showing Charlie Rogers as Bill Rogers' brother. There used to be a Bill Rogers running center store right behind the little plaza where the street is. He had a couple of stores. 
And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. And I go, why don't you tell me? <laughs> I was all excited showing Charlie. He goes, oh, yeah, I know that. I was like, why don't you tell me? I wouldn't take a picture. But it's just, it gets one of those things that also, if you're running, you can kind of look forward to seeing. You know, if you miss it, that's, you know, that's okay. If you get to the Mass Pike, you've missed it. If you get close to the Mass Pike overpass, you've missed it. But at least you're not running in the 50s because the little overpass, which is really nice if you ever driven it or have run it, it's a nice straight way into Kenmore Square. Well, the old days, it was curved. So what they did in the 50s is they straightened it out, the city, to realign it. But they didn't notify anybody, which they didn't have to. And the BAA didn't measure the course, which was out of it. And for a number of years, because they had straightened it out, shortened the course in the 50s. So at least what you're running is 26.2 miles. Uh, Kenmore Square is 1996 with 100 for Ronald McDonald's making sure you're okay. Um, this is a little different now. The bus station, I think, is, has a little better uh, configuration over here. Rosie would have had to jump in different spots. I think we, we did the train station here as well. Um, and this overpass, little bridge here, it has the Boston Strong painted. I'm sure if anyone's trained it, you know. But this is great. As I told someone before, right over here on the, on the ground is painted one mile to go. And it's like the culmination of everything you've trained for to see that before the finish line. And once you see the one mile to go, like I was telling someone, unless your leg is falling off, you're going to make it. Doesn't matter how fast, how slow. Um, and the people are just right up to you. It's, 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 it, and they still stay there because there's bars, they go in shifts. <laughs> I swear they go in like sections at a time, they get drinks for a half hour and come back because they're right they're, There's always people there. And I've run slow. I've run. My fastest Boston is around 340 something. My slowest is like seven hours and 12 minutes. And everything in between, there's always people there. And that's from a noontime start that I've done the changes too. So this is great. Um, the, the support that you'll get, this is what's really getting you going for the last mile. And you can just see where you're going. It's like one of those, uh, those apps that have that big thumbtack, <laughs> right? So this is like that big thumbtack. That's, like, yes, that's, that's where you're going. That's your goal, <laughs> which is great to have that in front of you. And this is it, Balls of Street, where you're running up. And what's great about this is that when people cheer, it just bounces off. It's so loud. It's just amazing. This is also, I always tell people, and you don't get it. You guys aren't going to get it until you run. This is the best and worst mile for you. Because you've redone your year. You annoyed your friends and family. You <laughs> forgot to pick up your kids. You. You've run through lunch. You've done whatever it is for these previous months for this moment. You do not want this moment to end. You want to soak up from when you take a turn off of Hereford Street and you run up here, you want to absorb everything. This is going to fill everything that you have um, emptied, mentally, physically, everything. However, you've just run 26 miles. You want to stop running. <laughs> so the dichotomy is tough it's an emotional you may cry at the end. you're so vulnerable that's why you see a lot of runners cry it's a very emotional vulnerability that it's not just you didn't just run a race there's a lot involved in this you know if you're running for somebody if you're running for yourself if you spent you know COVID years in a closet you know having you know million rice for you know, whatever you had to eat for pizza slices whatever you've done it's all going to come to this and I'm not building this up superficially. I'm telling you, this is going to be, you'll never forget this. No matter how you finish, when you finish, to the point that I always wanted my medal. And in 2012, the, the window is six hours. And I didn't know this as I was running, but Dave McKeever kept extending the window to get your medal and to be an official entrant because he didn't want people to run fast in the heat to kill themselves to get a medal. So mm -hmm. every half hour, 20 minutes, he would extend it, which I didn't know. It got to the point, I didn't care about getting a medal. I know this is blasphemy as a runner for Boston Marathon. I didn't care. I just wanted to finish. That was what was my goal in 2012. That's the personal goal I was going to take. I did get a medal, seven hours and 12 minutes. So he really started to extend it for everybody. That's what I'm saying for this whole thing. You know, it, it, it's just, it's a beautiful, some people just don't run it, don't get it, or they do sort of understand it. But that's what this is when you get to that stretch. And here's the finish line now. So you'll see this, you'll see this blue um, and the church tower from when you first turn on to here. Um, and they, they widen it open here too, which is nice. And don't forget, look good for the photo. Um, the last thing is with the finish line itself. Bill, um, Dave McGilvey always jokes, he's the only marathon race director that he knows that paints the finish line after the race, huh. which is kind of funny. 
um, which is true. He has this big latex, which most marathoners do now, that they put this two or three days before the marathon. If you're in the city, you can see this, that they unfurl this um, for the marathon. It's also done backwards because the photographers are on this side taking a picture of you. So when you cross it, you, just, you can't read the word finish. That's on purpose. Um, but they, they unroll this here, nice big latex. And it's, these first started to come out, they're a little slick. I remember Robert Cherry up with one boss a number of times in Chicago one year, slipped on this and hit his bag got concussion in Chicago. So the first ones weren't as porous when it was slick with sweat or, or mist, it was slippery. These, the, the newer ones are much better. They absorb more. Um, but then they roll this up and then that Wednesday or Thursday, depending on weather. And I, I did a story on this once for a magazine, like three or four in the morning in Boyle Street, dark. It, they close off the street. It was great, I could park right there. That's when they paint this with all the stencils. And the only reason I do that is for um, tourism, take pictures for the remainder of the year. That's the only time, that they, the only reason that they paint them. Um, so it's kind of neat to do. Uh, and don't forget your, when you get through the finish line, this is 96, I think, the hundredth, where we went all the way to the common. There's 38,000 runners getting your uh, mylar to sort of get you, keep your, whatever heat you do. It doesn't give you heat, it just sort of uh, captures what heat you do have, body heat, until you get a, a, a your own stuff. But this is kind of a great site that you see after the finish line to get your water, your metal. And I'll close on this photo here. I'll give you a moment to soak it in. Uh, I took this from the top of the Hancock and of Boston Street. <clears throat> There's a finish line. Oh, over here. There's a finish line right here. Boston Public Library is right here. This is Boston Street. Here's the Heinz Convention Center where you pick up your numbers ahead of time. There's Hereford Street where you turn on, you turn off here. Um, this is Newberry Street and Com Ave. The old days, real old days, the race would come down Commonwealth Avenue here and it would turn on Exeter Street here and finish right about here. When I began uh, this, the uh, Irvington Street Oval was down here, it's no longer there. The BA Clubhouse was down here, it's no longer here. All those black and white photos that you see the Johnny Kellings and stuff finishing and you see the Lennox in the background. If you look at the photo, the Lennox is on the left. That's, this is the Lennox Hotel. So that's all of those photos of that finish down where the VAA was, the headquarters. Um, from 1965 to 1985, all of those finishes, like I was telling you from Hayden Row, is the runners would come down Boylston Street here and then get off Boylston and run here on what was called Ring Road at the time. And the finish line was in front of the Prudential Center right here. It wasn't on Boylston Street, it was parallel. Ring Road is still a real road. But back then from 65 to 85, so again, all those Bill Rogers, all the winners that you see jumping in that little fountain, it's right here in front of that statue of that, that, that uh, gentleman that was stretched out in front of the Prudential Center. So from 1965 to 85, it was right here, all those uh, finishes. In 1985, when the BA finally, you know, relented and said we should get sponsorship money, everyone's going to Chicago, we got to get out of being an amateur sport. Uh, John Hancock said, okay, we'll give you a zillion dollars for 10 years, uh, but you gotta do one thing for us. It's to share what he wants to do. Move the finish line. We don't want the finish line in front of another insurance company. <laughs> like, uh, okay, we'll do that. So they moved it closer to the John Hancock Tower. So here's your check. Now you can catch it. Um, so it's closer to, you know, now it's not the John Hancock Tower, but anyway, uh, it's, it's been adjusted a little bit depending on roads and stuff, it's primarily the same spot. Um, so this is that stretch I was telling you about. This is, this is you're gonna love this whole stretch right here um, as you finish. So you, whether you're a spectator or a runner or plan to be a runner, um, this, is, this is what you want. So I hope you enjoy your little journey without sweating and you know, having to breathe heavy. But if anyone has any questions I can, about anything, running or spectating or as statues or anything I just sort of touched on, or you didn't even, there's a million stories, but um, there's something that you want to hear about that I didn't bring up. Any questions on, uh, all right, yeah. Um, so you mentioned the Hoyts, and um, I, I you know, grew up seeing them over the years yeah. in the 80s. It's, it's, are there any other stories like that that you, you know, just people that ran that weren't the best runners, but were just characters of the Boston Marathon. Like to me, they are the epitome of it. I was just wondering if there's any other characters. Characters, 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the Hoyts were great. I, I remember we were just waiting until Johnny Kelly finished. Um, there, he was going to finish. Some people would wait until he went by or when he finished, or politicians, Mayor Flynn would run a lot. Uh, you'd wait for that, or the celebrities uh, would finish or something. There's been times where you'll see a couple of years ago, somebody had a unicorn head, which is the unicorns, the, the logo of the Boston Athletic Association. That's kind of weird <laughs> to see a full human body with a big, good, it was a neat looking unicorn head. That was kind of weird. Um, my brother who was finishing, who was at the finish line waiting for me, yelled at me because a big hamburger and cheeseburger finished ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> that was embarrassing. And French fries. I saw them at the start, I took a picture and they were, it was for a restaurant, but it was big foam, good looking wow. hamburger it was suspended, cheeseburger and fries. I didn't know, so I'm running and also the hamburger, it was like a comedy, the hamburger and cheeseburger runs by me. And I'm like, son of a, and I couldn't even get the rest of the phrase out while well, some of the french fries were like, is that gonna be a drink? <laughs> I go, that was a minute. Um, I have seen, and this is, this is truly remarkable, uh, blind runners with guides. Yeah blows me away yeah. and I've run sort of next to them for a little while and the communication between the two and when you have people who can see fall on all the potholes yeah. it, it's just it's truly amazing they're tethered by like a little rope and the guy will have it and just the signals you know and, and, and they're, they're running very great form it's, it's amazing we have someone in town who does that really oh right. it, it's 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 remarkable and yeah. and, uh, and if you're complaining <laughs> you stop and hang. <laughs> you know, oh, I got a side oh, Okay. Um, and also with the uh, what are they called? The um, the uh, the amputee legs, but it's um, um, blade. blades. Yeah. The blades to actually um, I've seen blades. I've seen people walk, but to be behind someone who's running with two blades, yeah. which is a prosthetic. Yeah. Aerodynamically and physiologically, it's, it's stunning to watch um, that. It, it, it's, it's truly, I don't even know what to say. It's truly amazing to see how that, how they do that. And, and it's just because you're, you're with them. You know, it's like I remember with, you really don't know how fast elite athletes are unless you're with them. We're never going to be with them. I remember I was at a relay at the Cape. So I'm doing the full Cape Cod Marathon. Bill Rogers is doing the relay. Bill Rogers was, was at the relay um, section somewhere. And I went past, and I'm not like, hey, Bill, I was going, hey, I'll see you at the finish, all right. I went past him, like two miles later, the sun's behind us, I'm seeing this shadow <laughs> get bigger and bigger. And Bill just flies by me, which I know he would, but unless you're, you know, it's like driving with the IndyCar guys go really fast. Unless you're driving your car with them, you really get no, or if you're watching the elite run by you. But if you're with that, to really get a connection of how it is. So to see the blade, boy, it's just so smooth and rhythmic. Um, it's difficult if I was talking to someone and, and they really got to train, retrain themselves <clears throat> of how to do that. It's amazing to, to see something like that. Um, I'm just going to add on that note. Um, I ran Boston one year and um, running behind a double amputee on the two um, blades and on his shirt on the back, it said, don't listen to that voice in your head that says you can't. Yeah. And I'll never forget. That. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Isn't it? It's just it's yeah. it just it lifts you up. Yeah, it's like okay. So Not just the running. Yeah. yeah, you that you take that with you. Because we all have that voice. Oh, yeah. all that. I remember running by there was a gentleman in front of me. Um, not a character, but a name for it. And he had um, it was like Schwarzenegger or Rambo with like you know belts of guns, bullets, but they were little packages of uh, jelly beans. <laughs> now you can buy this is before. Now you can buy belts and put little little uh, Iron Man things of fluids on them. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's, he had a makeshift thing. <laughs> so he's running and he's got a jelly bean. And I know my mother was diabetic, so I, I got what he was doing. I was thinking either, either that or we just, it's um, the goo. Mm -hmm. Jelly beans are just coming up. They were little goos. So he's doing that. Guy runs next to us. I wasn't with him. So he runs by and he's sort of running. He sees a guy eating jelly beans and sort of slows. We're all running. And he sort of slows and goes, diabetic? Guy goes, yeah, why? He goes, was that like a Snickers bar? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like a camaraderie. It's a neat little thing to see what works to everybody. Uh, I remember someone had a straw on their ear. I'm going, they just like come out of McDonald's or doing that? So I was behind this person as we were getting to a water station. And the trick of a water station, 
There's a myriad of problems with how you can get water. Um, what I do is I'll grab a cup <clears throat> and I'll grab two cups, one of water, one of Gatorade, mix them together for the color that I know is what I can tolerate. And I'll poke the lid and kind of close it a bit so I can drink it. Because if you just try to drink the whole thing, it's like, what do you think? There's just tons of tricks. She took the straw out, grabbed the cup and said, drink it with a straw. Put the cup, put the straw back. I go, that's an awesome idea. No bubbles, no splashing. So you learn of all these things to see that would work. Um, so you pay attention, because again, what are you gonna do when you run? You run, you look at other things and stuff like that. But um, the, the hamburger and cheeseburger thing is really <laughs> You know they're good, the guy's calves, and you know they're good. You have to be good <clears throat> to do something like that, but it's just, you don't want it. I mean, they have your brother to say, yeah. I saw the hamburger, where were you? <laughs> So your last year that you ran it was 2012? Yes. Is that why you didn't mention the bombing at all? Well, no, I, I, it's funny. Um, 2002, yeah, it's like there by the grace, right? I've run 23 in a row. And the first one I missed yeah. is 2013. It was a deadline for my book was the following spring. Okay. So I couldn't train and write a book at the same time. Um, the ironic thing with 2012, like I was saying, the BEA offered entrance you could defer official entrance could defer to 2013 if it was too hot i did and you did and you were smart like my, my cousin did that yeah. and i was making fun of him all week going oh, come on you can suck it up and like you know that night you know he's tracking me you know so yeah. so like that then i call him i go you're the smart one i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i shouldn't have run i mean that's not that i'm a alberto salazar i think but running 90 full marathon 91 degrees does something to you I feel fine, everything, but I knew yeah. I really shouldn't have done that. Uh, if you're running earlier, and I didn't push myself, I really did it. I, w I actually didn't feel dehydrated, which was amazing because I really, I've had other ones where I did. <laughs> but I, you knew ahead of time. I'm in the Chicago Marathon a couple of years earlier than that, those six or seven. Some people died and they stuck the marathon yeah. because of the heat that sort of snuck up on them. Yeah. We knew that whole week. It was going to be bad. So we had all the preparation. Everyone really knew what to do, what not to do. Um, you know, I can say this because I'm a runner. We're not that smart. Yeah. Primarily. Yeah. More men, I guess, in the way. We're not that smart. We'll, we'll go out and run. You know, golfers will go out and golf in the rain. We'll just do that. Um, but we're nice. So, yeah, we should have. I should have not. Uh, and I was, a good, I was in shape. I was doing fine. We just we really shouldn't have. Um, but then 2013. You know, and, and that's why some of the things I was telling you about with the screen tunnel, um, they permit the race from curb to curb is what the permit is for the BEA to have the race. So they have to know, especially after the bombing, every race since the bombing, you had to know everyone that was within that curve of both curves. So your water stations, your spotters network, the people who give us the little times that you see in the CD screen, uh, the medical tents, all the runners, everything, no bandits that year. You, you had, they had to know, the VA, the state, the Fed, they had to know who is within the road from curb to curb uh, based on that. So that's why there's nothing on the other side, uh, one of the reasons there's nothing on the other side of the wells um, stemming from the 1996 putting up fencing. But yeah, they're real strict with that uh, from the bombings on that. Um, the, the thing with the St. Ignatius Church, which I didn't mention, um, but you bring up the bombing, so many different stories. The St. Ignatius Church, which is a church that's at the edge of Dawson. It's not, it's not BC's church, but it's on the edge of uh, BC near Lake Ave. I sometimes tell the story when I show the photo with Lake Ave. There was about four or 500 runners stopped in that area. Because when the first bomb went off, what they did is they um, really didn't know what it was to an extent. And once they start figuring something's wrong around here, instead of coming down to Hereford, they directed runners on Com Ave to, to, to avoid this area. So there's a period of time that runners were directed on Com Ave. And then once they realized what it was, they just said, it's done. So there were people, a lot of runners stuck uh, near the um, underpass of Mass Ave, um, near BC, and another place had a, a, a big cluster. The St. Ignatius opened up their doors and they brought people in. The camp at the school brought uh, food, bagels, cell phone chargers because they shut off the cell phones because they found other bomb, they found other packages. They didn't know if there's going to be something at every mile. Mm -hmm. So they shut off, the feds shut off the communication of cell phones. If you're in a hotel, you couldn't get out. There were people in the hotels. I had friends of mine in the hotel. 
uh, who could be up. Um, I don't mean to bring it down. It's just, it, it just, it just reminded me of stories of, of neat things when people were at the Mass Ave. There were people in the apartments watching it on TV. They came out with blankets and bottles of water. They're like, this is happening outside my street. And they came out to help people. Because you know, when you're a runner, especially at that beyond 15, 16, 17 miles, your blood's flowing, your, your heart rate's up, your muscles are warm. But when you stop running, the blood pressure goes down, the heart rate goes down, you become no, the body gets back to normal, you get a chill, even in, in the hot summer. Add to that any emotional stress and everything, you know, you're, you saw people shivering. That's just a normal, you see people shivering the finish line on a normal day of the marathon. You know, that's just what happens. So now you're a couple of miles away, not knowing what's going on. Your, your parents or friends are here or somewhere, whatever. Add everything else you had to. So to see all the people come out quickly, that was, that's one of the things that I think really replaced that, that feeling of dread, the moment, I want to say momentary, the first feelings of dread were so quickly replaced by seeing all that support, uh, at least what I was seeing on that. Uh, I think it was just the start of, and, and that was just then to see that. And then the enormity of it in the days and weeks and years after that. But just to see that support right on the course, um, the phone charges blew me away. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's my phone charges. Now you're out there for a few hours. Uh, translators at BC, there's some translators at Ignatius Church. I've run races in Germany and stuff. I don't know the language. All these little things you don't think of, right? Mm -hmm. So the BA volunteers started, officials with their clipboards went back, back track the course to get your number. That's why you put your name and address in the back. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to make sure on the counts. All right, are you, we have buses. You want to come with us? Are you, I live, in, I live near, you know, 20, 20 minutes from BC. If I was, if I had run that year, I would have been around DC area time-wise. I would just call the home and they would have picked me up. So I would have told the volunteer, no, I'll have someone pick me up. Good, check them off. So they, they backtracked the course to account for everybody. Wow. Yeah. So this, you know, all is in addition to it being a crime scene. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember Dave McGill, we told really resonated of the many stories. Dave McGill was just about to run, like I was telling you in um, Hockington. He was ready. And he has some state troopers with him. He tells the story. So I'm not speaking out of school, but it really hitches to the bone. He was in Hawkington, had some state troopers ready to go. All of a sudden, he hears all the walkie-talkies that are in sync. Stop. And they went to Dave, and they say the, the report of a bomb. And he always says with anything, but it's a water main break, fencing fell down. He goes, how does he do it? Something like, do you see it? Is this reliable? Because some people go, oh, it's a water main break. Well, did you see the pipe? Well, no, I just see a puddle. Well, go to it, and then let me know. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. So with the bomb, he's like, was it a transformer? I go, did you see it? They said, yes. So then he jumped in the state troopers and within, I think he said 20 minutes, they flew him into the, to the Hereford Street. Now, Dave McGilvery has one of like three passes that you can get everywhere. Like Tom Grill, the, the top people have the pass that gets you everywhere. So he got dropped off right here at Hereford. Now they blocked off Hereford Street, but he drove up here and they brought him here. So he's walking up and the Fed stopped him. They said, you didn't know who it was. So you can't you can't come in because they blocked up. They made this a whole crime scene, if you remember, like a couple of streets up. And they told Dave he can't come in. He goes, I'm, "I'm the race director. It's my race." And he said, "No, it's not." He goes, "It's a crime scene. It's ours." And that's when Dave went from race director to my kids are here on the tent. He goes, "It was just a switch. I was no longer a race director. This wasn't my race anymore. Where are my kids? Now the kids were on the other side, so the, the snow fencing blocked." Um, most of the debris that would have reached over. So he got the kids were safe and then everyone became into that mode. Um, but it's just, so, it's just so fast. They had, for, for one of the books, I talked to the Board of Health in the, um, in the city. See if I get these numbers right. They had within 20 or 25 minutes, everyone who was injured, other than the three fatalities, were in hospitals. And I think it was 200 and 65, something like that. I have the exact numbers. So quickly, because what they had their process procedure anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've been running down here and I've never seen, and they have wheelchairs lined up on a normal year and they have walkie talkies. When I go to a medical tent on the course to get Vaseline or paper towel, they know I'm coming over I am because they see me sort of veer. I'm not wobbling, but if they, they see someone coming in, they are so prepared. Mm -hmm. So something like this, 
and they have ambulance backups and setups. So they had a number of ambulances here, did those ambulances over there to make up for this. So when they needed them all, they just put that chain of uh, command in and they just, they lined them up. I think it was in 20, it was less than a half hour, all 260 something from uh, the forum to uh, Marathon Sports were out. That's, that's remarkable. That's a testament to planning, having the medical tent right here. It's just, and that's in addition to the people who were getting care. Um, and there were people need more like a tip balance, things like that. But you had people who got care. That's remarkable. So between that and the support on the course, I mean, what can you ask? I mean, that is just, you can't even, you wouldn't think that was true if you wrote that in story mm -hmm. for a movie. That's just remarkable. And that's just within an hour. Imagine that. That's just, that's just remarkable. And then Matt Kofetsky ran in 2014. That yeah, was his Oh my goodness. He goes, that's, he goes, hey, he goes, Paul, that's what he's telling other people this. He goes, that's what got me through. He goes, yeah, because he had the names of them on the bib. And he goes, that's just, and you could just tell it, the city was, was surrounded by him on that. It, it was just amazing, you know, to, to have that shine through. And it's just this small section. I mean, just think of it. To, to get everyone out so quickly and to the hospital and to get the hospitals ready. <clears throat> so when they come on there, so yeah, yeah, that's remarkable. So any other questions on? Uh... Oh, this is great. Oh, thank yeah, you. I appreciate that. It. Well, it's so much, so much fun. <laughs> it really is. And, and like I say, Boston, I'm going to say more than anyone else, maybe the Olympics are different. Boston, I mean, even a month before Boston, you got Bill Rogers on a cherry picker putting up the banners, the marathon banners, right? You have each city along the course getting their daffodils and stuff. I mean, and their banners now they're starting to do. And you start seeing the elite athletes training, right? You'd be driving around Calm Avenue going, oh, this is Linden. There's, you know, yeah. you don't really get that. In other, and I've done, like I said, the 43 marathons, 20 of them, 20, 19 of them have been in different states and countries. And you never really get that. Some of them are like, hey, thanks for running, get out of here. Mm -hmm. you know, but there are exceptions that they, they do welcome you in a short period of time, they welcome you. Boston, it's like, a, it's like a ride. It is a passage of spring. Spring starts when you start seeing them. I mean, you have a formal winner and a cherry picker in the center. Of the city. It's a media event, putting out banners. That tells you something, you know, that, that we have, because it affects everybody. The 30,000 runners could be your neighbor, your kid, your school. That either benefits from it, is money being raised, or just a personal accomplishment. So the, the wide ranging effect on that uh, is remarkable. You can't beat that. And it's a great sport. Anyone can do it. Any other questions? Uh? No, we're not we're talking here. No, all right. Well, I appreciate it. I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.